Okay, welcome to the Barbados Department of Archives. My name is Stacey Adams, and we are here with proud son of the soil and St. Peter resident, Eard Atherley. Now, Mr. Atherley will share on his family's business as well as his ancestral connections within the parish of St. Peter. Good afternoon, Mr. Atherley. Good afternoon, Stacey. Tell us a, a bit about where you're from and you know what was it like growing up in St. Peter? Okay, my father came out of St. Philip, ticket St. Philip, and he met my mother who lived in Carrington's village, St. Michael. And after my uncle had won the sweet state sometime in the 30s, okay. uh, all of the St. Philip side, my father's family moved to, not all, but most of them moved okay. to St. Peter. And uh, out of that money, my uncle and my and my father and other uncles, they, they set up a business which was called Atherley Brothers. Nice. My father's shop grocery was in Milan Quarter, and they would have all started up in the early 40s. My uncle's, which was the biggest establishment, that was a grocery in Spikestown and bakery. That was on Church Street, just opposite the south gate of the St. Peter's Anglican Parish Church. Okay. Uh, after my uncle's business wrapped up, there was Wally's store there, and presently the S. White Adams Spike Stone store is there. Apart from that, there were three or four other shops. Uncle Eugene owned, uh, he was a butcher in Kew Road and Eagle Hall. He lived in Kew Road, but the shop was in Eagle Hall. Evans, my cousin Evan Affley, ran the, the one in Whole Town, and my uncle Bartlett ran the one in St. Joseph Melville Hill. So all in all were six establishments. Wow. Called Atherley Brothers. Called Atherley Brothers. Yes. Okay. Um, can you share a bit about some of your family connections, um, be it marriage or otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, in within the parish of St. Peter? Well, as I just told you, we were communes, you know, yes. right? right? Came out of St. Philip and came to St. Peter. Uh, my father ran his shop. There were three boys. I'm the last of three from his wife. And of course, like most shopkeepers, he had some outside children. Wow. I don't call them half brothers. They have no half brothers. Yeah, they have, we normally call right, them you know, right, just brothers. Brothers, they're brothers. You know, that differentiate right, and they, who are half. Right, and they yeah. would have been from people who worked in the shop. Okay. Right, so apart from that, I don't have any real family connections except by marriage, my brothers being married to, and myself being married, but but uh, no and real family connections. Right, and, and some of these persons' surnames via marriage. Well, well they, there was my older brother, my older brother, he's died now, but uh, he's married to, his wife has also died, Maureen Sobers. Sobers, right. Right, mm -hmm. whose father were, operated the hoist at him and sugar factory back okay. then. Uh, but uh, that's about it. The other brothers who are married, they're married outside of the parish. People okay. from outside. Okay, yeah. we know that you're a, um, we learned that you're a tour guide and a former educator. Um, you're also a deputy chair of the St. Peter Organizing um, Committee, Committee. Yeah, yeah. right? Um, tell us some of the, the peculiar features of the parish of St. Peter. Well, I could let you know, well, I'm a tour guide, yes. We have, we are the only parish with two signal stations. Okay. Dover Fort on the premises of the Coors and Parry School. After the Easter 1816 Buster Slave Rebellion, mm -hmm. and the governor, the British governor, commanded that uh, signal stations should, be, should operate. It had already operated as a fort, an inland fort, and then it also became signal station. So like uh, that and Grenade Hall, the only parish with two signal stations. St. Peter's also is the only parish that has four different topographies, topographical features. Yes, it has we have right, we've got the West Coast, that West Coast. Only parish with a West Coast separated from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. West Coast touching the Caribbean Sea, the East Coast at Pico Tenerife touching the, the Atlantic Ocean. Right. St. Lucie has that, but St. Lucie is contiguous. Mm -hmm. But we are separate. Yeah. And uh so we've got that lower coral limestone terrace, the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Then when you come up the station hill by the police station and the St. Joseph Hospital, that's the second, the intermediate coral limestone terrace. 
Then when you pass the gas station in Bonner Corner, you go up Ben Hill, past the All Saints, up to Farley Hill, that's the Upper Coral Limestone Terrace. Right. And then when you look over from Farley Hill downwards to Greenland, and part of that, we go into the Scotland district, which is clay and shale right. and sand. So it's the only part that features all four topographical features because it traverses the island. Hence, it touches the east, it touches the west coast Caribbean Sea and the east coast at Pico Tenerife, right. the Atlantic Ocean. So those are some of the peculiar features of St. Peter. And, and about the whole um, Barbados, Carolina connection as well. Yes, so. well, most of the rich English plantation owners who live in the northeast of St. Peter, Bosque, Bell, and so on, because there was a time when they wanted to divide St. Peter into two separate parishes. Mm -hmm. The moot was put forward, but it never reached the parliament. That's why it didn't happen. But from 1655 until 1665, they would have named one parish All Saints, the other St. Peter. From 1655 to 65, the All Saints Church served as the main parish church in St. Peter because the parish church built in 1629, the termites had even, even it down its board, and therefore the All Saints Church actually served as the main parish church. But uh, St. Peter has a lot of history, of course, the fortifications of St. Peter, mm -hmm. you've got five fortresses, you could actually say six if you go further up Roadview, where there was the meeting point, but you've got Denmark Fort, Fort Denmark, which is down by the old Arms House, mm -hmm. next to Jordan's supermarket, you go down that road, mm -hmm. that's the old Jordan's. Arms House, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you had Coconut Fort, which was a bit inland between the door, between Denmark Fort and more like where the Mango Lane is, Coconut right. Fort was there. Then you had Orange Fort, which was next to the fish market. Right. There were five cannons there, and we are asking for our five cannons to be brought back from the defense force and put in position there, next to the Esplanade. So that's three so far. Then there was one at Haywoods, right. where the Almond um, Beaches, I can't say beaches, beaches yet, because it's not beaches yet. Right. And then the other fort, the final one was on the hill, on the premises of, of the Coors and Parry School. So they had to fortify Spikes Town because it was the main town for about the first 10 years of Barbados' existence. It was the first town, a seaport, and it was heavily fortified. So that by the time Cromwell got here, he, well not Cromwell himself, but he sent a fleet of 10 vessels under the command of Sir George Askew to take Barbados. As you know, Cromwell had, he beheaded James the, Charles I, and he declared himself a Lord Protector of England. And knowing Barbados to be strategically located, the closest island to the Europe and to England, the first point at which the English would stop. Because London, there were three main entrepôts of the British. London in England, Bridgetown, Barbados, and Boston on the eastern seaboard of the United States. So Barbados was important, and Cromwell felt that if he could take Barbados, he could sail with the wind and take the other islands. But that was not to be. Sir George Askew got to Barbados, was unable to land at Bridgetown, mm -hmm. sailed to the north, to Spikestown. He managed to land, land there, he got inland with his men, but the governor sent the militia down and they chased him off. The rest you ought to know, they went to Oysters, they created a blockade. The Barbadian planters, the majority of whom were royalists and supporters of Charles II, yes. who had gone into exile after his father had been guillotined. Uh, he had gone into exile in, the, in, in Guernsey, an island in the English Channel. Right. And uh, what happened is the Barbadian planters actually declared Barbados independent from the Cromwellian Republic. They wanted nothing to do with the Crom Cromwellian Republic. And then there was a compromise, as in the Treaty of Barbados, which is at Oysters, the Mer Mermaid Tavern. Yes. And in that compromise, Sir George Askew, the commander of the Cromwellian forces, became governor of Barbados and Lord Willoughby stepped down, the, Roy the royalist governor stepped down. So there's a lot of, but the only place that the Cromwellian forces were able to land was in Spikestown. And that, there was a battle which ensued at a place called Batali's, mm -hmm. Battle Alley, yes. just outside of Spikestown where the Christ is the Answer Family yes. Church yes. and the Royal and Edward School. Very right, the that's right. Yes. So there's a lot of right. history and legacy in Spikestown. Mm -hmm. And I think what we should be moving towards right now Mm -hmm. is to get World Heritage designation for Spikes Town. The Carolinas right. connection, the Bristol connection, the battle, all of these the things. The Jewish synagogue. The Jewish synagogue as well. Yes, yes William Spike was a Jew. Mm -hmm. Large 
a, a large landowner and Spike Sound was named after him. There was a smaller cathedral built there, but nobody seems to know where it is. My belief is that it was in the area of the St. Peter's Parish Church. Church. Yes. Unlike the 1654 cathedral in Bridgetown, nobody's been able to locate it, but uh, I think we should work on trying to get to know exactly where it is. Tell us of the hobbies of persons, because I...